Maserati, the famed Italian car maker with 110 year provenance, manufacturing racing and sports cars. And it's a brand that in the last half century or so has been commercially tied to the likes of Fiat, Alfa Romeo and once arch rivals Ferrari. And then, just two years ago, a motoring brand as passionate and evocative as any in motoring history was bought by Stellantis. And it spawned this mid-size SUV. Well, sort of. The Grecale, that gets its name from a Mediterranean wind, was announced in late 2020, which was just before Stellantis showed up in the picture. And it's the second SUV from Maserati after the large segment Levante showed up around a decade ago. Production version of the Grecale lobbed globally late last year, and it only arrived in Australia just a couple of months ago. Which brings us neatly to today and our first drive of the Italian family hauler. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. Versatility, elegance, performance, and innovation. To make a claims that the Grecale aims to balance those four elements. This is the base GT version, which fits a regular two liter turbocharged four cylinder, outputting 221 kilowatts and 450 newton meters. Outright, those aren't exactly what you call lazy figures for a two liter engine, though it is 21 kilowatts down on the Modena and it's not exactly what you would call intoxicating. Of course, the trade-off in the dividend is pricing. The entry Grecale GT clocks in at 109,500. So that's cheaper than Audi's diesel-powered SQ5 and about 10 grand more than BMW's X3 xDrive 30i, which doesn't quite have the output of the Grecale. Now that's not chump change, but it's clearly pitched directly against key obvious premium SUV rivals. Then there's the Alfa Romeo Stelvio with its vastly more affordable Veloce version at around 83 grand. That is probably this Maserati's key nemesis because it fits a very similar two liter turbocharged engine and it sits on the same Giorgio platform as the Grecale. So back to two of those four pillars, performance and innovation, there's really not much of that going on here with the powertrain and the platform. That's not to say it doesn't lack some outright performance, but before we get into the business of driving, let's check out the rest of the package. Outside, the GT fits 19 inch wheels, passive suspension, an open rear mechanical diff, and quad exhaust tips. You also get Maserati's signature Trident badge on the C-pillar. You do get full LED lighting and niceties such as puddle lights and a kick sensitive rear electric tailgate. But the only real innovation that's happening on the outside is the electric door handles, which seems to be motoring's little pony trick of the moment. The headlights look very, very similar to something that we've seen on premium SUVs before. And you get one Maserati Trident on top of another Maserati Trident, just in case you forgot what you spent your money on. Our car does fit 20 inch wheels and a glass roof, which just begins to scratch away at the exhaustive and pricey list of options. Four grand's worth of wheels, two grand's worth of paint, and over 10 grand's worth of tech and comfort addenda pumps our version out to 132 grand. And some of these cost optional extras are on the inside. So let's check that out. Climb inside and first impressions are, very good. It looks great in here, it smells great in here, and it's fast approaching what you would expect from a proper Maserati. The real highlight in here is the lavishly stitched leather trim. It's on the seat, it extends through the dash fascia, and on the door cards. It's called Leather Grain B, as in B for Bob, and it is part of the comfort pack, which you do have to pay extra for. It does, though, feel very sumptuous, and it is worth a fair chunk of the optional price of entry. You do sense that much effort has been put into generating a sophisticated vibe here in the cabin. And a lot of that comes down to the extensive leather work, this really neat floating infotainment system, and some of the burnished details in the doors. These big elephant ear paddle shifters to a real aluminium. Things are a little bit more conventional and familiar when it comes to the steering wheel that does look suspiciously like an Alfa Romeo item. However, this tiller gets a button on the left to start the engine and a button on the right to change drive selection. And the wheel frames a 12.3 inch TFT driver's display that will change its skins depending on which of the three drive modes you choose. There is no transmission selector and if it's anything like my experience, you might fumble around the cabin until you can find these four buttons on the center stack in order to select park, drive, and reverse. And what I have discovered in a fairly short period of time is that it is pretty terrible. You'll be in drive and go to hit reverse and it doesn't immediately activate and the car will tend to creep forward. There's no positivity in changing the transmission mode and it can be a little bit daunting and frankly, 
a little bit dangerous. There are some other areas as well where Maserati feels compelled to reinvent the wheel, such as the multimedia and control system here, which has a 12.3 inch touchscreen on the top and an 8.8 .8 touchscreen down below. Again, in my initial experience with the Gracale, I was fumbling around to figure out how to turn the headlights on and off. And they're actually down here in this touch panel. The same goes for the volume for the audio, which is in a hidden slider panel on the left-hand side of the frame or with buttons underneath the steering wheel rim. When you can control the volume, the quality of the audio from the Sonus Faber 14 speaker audio system is quite fantastic. Clearly Maserati is caught up in the philosophy like so many other car makers that all your control adjustments should be done through a touchscreen, like your phone. But they seem to forget that there's one key reason why it's actually illegal to use your phone while you're driving, and that's because you actually need to look at it while you're adjusting the controls. If you do have to fish around in touchscreens to turn your headlights on and off, it is very, very distracting. That's regardless of how familiar you might be with the system. The surround view camera monitoring system is very good, although the frame rate is a little bit slow. The time-honored Maserati mechanical clock has been replaced by a digital version. I must say it is pretty neat. You can change to different watch face designs and display things such as compass or a G-meter. One area that will polarize in here are the seats themselves. So while the leather is lovingly tactile, the padding underneath is actually very stiff and not terribly comfortable. Strangely, these are the 12-way luxury power seats, which are cost optional. And while some people will find that the fairly stiff support will be quite pleasing, I just don't think they're quite cushy and comfy enough. Another thing about the cabin is that despite the luxurious veneer, there is a bit of a whiff of Alfa Romeo in here that extends beyond the look of the steering wheel. For me, that's not necessarily a bad thing because I'm quite partial to the Four Leaf Clover brand. But this might be noticeable and it might matter to some buyers who really want to live the authentic Maserati dream. And some of those owners will undoubtedly be cross-shopping this Gracale against the Stelvio. Maserati is boasting class-leading space in the second row, and it is quite roomy in here for a mid-size SUV. And a lot of that comes down to its sheer size. At over 4.8 meters in length, and with a 2.9 meter wheelbase, the Gracale is quite long for a mid-sizer. Presentation and execution of the second row mirrors the high quality of the first row. And the seats mirror the fronts as well. They're lovingly trimmed and look fantastic, although they are a little stiff when it comes to padding. The dual zone climate control of the base GT features rear vents, although you do have to step up to higher grade versions to get a proper three zone system that has rear touchscreen controls. There is no tilt or slide adjustment on the rear seat, but that's compensated for by a lot of nice little touches, such as the very plush carpet. You also get some of the expected stuff like USB-A and USB-C device power, as well as a fold down armrest with a couple of cup holders. The ambience in here though is very, very nice. And some of that comes down to the cream color scheme and the full length glass roof. All in all, it's pretty classy accommodation for adults or kids in the back. So let's check out the boot. Simulate your best Roberto Baggio World Cup penalty shootout and you will get 535 liters of boot space. You do get 40, 20, 40, rear seat split folding that can be folded using the levers in the back and the load space is actually quite narrow. Underneath there's no spare wheel but you do get an inflator kit. The Gracale is covered by a slim three-year warranty although Maserati can extend warranty conditionally on some of its models. Servicing is required every 12 months and you can pay up front for a three-year $45,000 package for two and a half grand. Again, consumption is around 9 litres per 100 at best, so if you're expecting Toyota hybrid-like economy, you plumb out of luck. And it does require 98 octane fuel. If you're expecting spicy character and a soundtrack that will give your soul a bit of a squeeze, you've really come to the wrong Maserati. Or at least the wrong end of the Gracale lineup. There's certainly nothing wrong with a 2 litre turbo that outputs an old school 300 horsepower. One with direct injection and a second generation multi-air valve system. And it's also branded as a hybrid or a mild hybrid depending on which Maserati literature you read. Hmm. The system uses a belt starter generator and a 48 volt battery system. Either of these can power what Maserati calls an e-booster or an electric compressor, which works in tandem with a conventional turbocharger. Put simply, both the compressor and the turbocharger boost the inlet charge of the internal combustion system. 
and thus there's no electric motor so there's no dedicated electric drive and you can take that hybrid shtick with a big grain of salt. There's even an animated screen on the multimedia system labelled electric vehicle which it most certainly isn't and there are plenty of red and green graphics that sort of suggest to you that there is some sort of electric drive when in fact there isn't. This bears out in fuel consumption so for an alleged hybrid the best that the GT does is 8.7 litres per 100 combined and this will pump out to 9.2 in a claim depending on the options fitted to the vehicle. The consumption isn't too bad for the sort of output that this engine provides but for something that's labelled as a hybrid that's pretty ordinary. But my big gripe is this engine really doesn't have much in the way of character and that's really not good news for a mark that's really all about character. The engine does provide ample shove but really no matter what drive mode that you put it in it is really too quiet though it is nicely quiet when you're cruising. Thing is it's not terribly fiery even when you dig in really hard. This sort of character might be all well and good if you're just in the Gricale for the class and the comfort but even when you're primarily using it as a comfy Grand Tourer it's not quite as polished as it should be. The engine's married to a ZF 8-speed which is at its core a good unit although it's not really a harmonious marriage with this Turbo 4. It's a little grumpy at low speed and the powertrain is a little bit pattery at the low speed stuff and stop start. It's not bad but the drivability could be a bit more rounded and more assertive particularly when you're driving a part throttle. Swift well if it does prove to be as quick as its 5.6 second claim it certainly doesn't feel like it by the seat of the pants. And ultimately the real lack of fanfare is a bit of a letdown. The chassis is well fine enough for the job. At its best this Giorgio platform can be an absolute pearler particularly in something like the Alfa Giulia although less so than when it underpins the likes of the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Some versions of the Gricale fit air springs and adaptive dampers either standard or optionally but here it's purely steel springs and passive dampers and this GT version gets an open diff rather than the locking diff that you do get on the more powerful Moderna. It corners well fine there's plenty of grip from the 235mm rubber although you do get much wider and fatter rubber on high spec versions but with what it's got it does turn and point quite reasonably well. But I will wager that this base Gricale is the least sporty Maserati that you could name. The steering for its part is pretty good it's quite light and aloof around town but when you do actually get it into the corners there is quite a nice semblance of feel and tactility and communication that comes through the tiller. Those four piston Brembo brakes well they really are quite wooden and not quite progressive enough. All in all it drives like a competent and slightly sporty SUV although not a particularly thrilling one and it certainly doesn't pull a heartstrings on road like a proper Maserati should. It's not lacking for safety features but some of the calibrations is a little bit clumsy and gremlin prone. For instance this is the one and only press car that I've ever had the reverse AEB trigger while trying to reverse into my home car space. It's all a little bit too normal and not quite exotic enough but that also bears out when it comes to ownership but not in a bad way. If you're after a mid-size SUV with a Maserati badge and the cachet that that brings, the Gricale is certainly for you. Ditto when it comes to expectations of a sense of occasion, at least when experienced from the inside. Outside, well for my money, the styling doesn't exactly reach into your rib cage and give your heartstrings a bit of a squeeze. And perhaps crucially the same can be said about the driving experience. It's certainly quiet and very competent but if you want even a slice of that classic Maserati essence you've really come to the wrong place. However at just 110 grand it's vastly more attainable than some of its exotic forebears. However I do expect that you have to walk up to the Trofeo version at 165 grand to really find yourself in classic Maserati territory. I do look forward to uncorking one of those supercar engine Trofeos sometime in the future but for now that's what I think but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below, don't forget to subscribe and as always thanks for watching Chasing Cars.